Chapter 6 The pigeon coop became our home, and no Nazi was the wiser. I was old enough that my parents couldn't keep me inside all the time now. I took my mother's place in line for our rations, and sometimes my father and I were pulled off the street to work outside the ghetto. But each day we returned to our little sanctuary on the roof and slid the steel bars down tight to protect us. Mother began to talk again and to smile, but every now and then I would catch her staring at the door to the roof, and I knew what she was thinking. The home invasions continued without warning, slowly bleeding everything of value the ghetto still hoarded. And once a week, on the Sabbath, the Nazis would conduct resettlements when they came and took more people away. Thousands at a time, pushed into trucks and taken to villages in the east. Some who were taken escaped and sneaked back to the ghetto, and they told stories of camps where Jews were worked to death. My father told me not to listen to the rumors, but we were still careful to bar the big steel door at the top of the stairs every night, and every time we heard the cries and screams of a new resettlement, we huddled in fear. I was almost 13 years old now, and it was hard to remember any other life except for my daydreams of food. Bigo stew with meat and mushrooms and cabbage, roast chicken, cucumber salad, piorgi filled with potatoes, cheese, and onions, fried and butter, cheesecake, apple tarts. I would have traded a week's worth of rations just to have another pot of my mother's delicious tomato soup. With each passing day, I grew thinner and thinner until hunger was my constant companion. I longed for nighttime and the blessed relief sleep brought. The only time I didn't think about eating was when I was asleep. One cold February day, the director of the Judenrat called for a ghetto-wide meeting in Zodi Square, and my father and I went to hear what he had to say. The director was not a popular man. The members of the Judenrat were hated throughout the ghetto for working with the Nazis. But any man the Nazis assigned to the Judenrat who refused was shot or hanged so I didn't see what choice they had. Some of the Judenrat police enjoyed their new jobs too much, it was true, but there were others who tried to do what the Germans told them without making things worse for their fellow Jews. The square was crowded, but not everyone in the ghetto was there, not nearly. The director could tell this too. He checked his watch one last time and bent forward to speak into the microphone. When I call for a meeting, all of you must come, he told us. Tell your neighbors, hiding away will not help. I glanced nervously at my father. We're afraid we'll be taken away, someone yelled. We're shot and killed in the street, someone else said. The director signaled for everyone to settle down. My friends, I come to you with a terrible request, but one which I have no choice but to accede to. The Nazis have ordered me to give them 7,000 Jews to be deported from the Krakow ghetto tomorrow morning. The crowd came alive with murmurs and sobs and shouts. 7,000 Jews, I thought, trying to comprehend a number so big. There had been resettlements going on all the while, but nothing on this scale. Never so many people. We can do nothing about this. 7,000 people will be deported but we can choose who will go and who will remain. You can choose, you mean, someone yelled. The Germans need good, healthy workers here in the ghetto, the director said. You call this healthy, a man cried. I haven't eaten meat in a year. Others in the crowd shouted angrily that they were starving. I nodded, feeling my own hunger pangs. If we prove ourselves useful to the German war effort, they will take fewer of us away. They will keep us here and keep us alive, the director said. We must therefore think carefully about who we send away and who remains. We must give them those who cannot work. More murmuring among the crowd. Who can he mean? I asked my father. Everyone in the ghetto worked. Even my mother had been taken to the factories when she was caught out on the streets. My friends, the director said, I must reach out my arms and beg. Mothers and fathers, give me your children. The crowd in the square erupted with rage. Angry shouts were raised from every mouth. Fists shook in the air. An empty green bottle flew through the air and shattered at the base of the stage where the director stood. 
I was scared, but I felt angry too. I held on to my father's arm. They go to a better place, the director said, ducking a rock. The children will be sent to resettlement camps. Work camps, someone near me yelled. Death camps, another person cried. I'm trying to save lives, the director roared. Do you understand? Which is better, that 40,000 of us remain or that the whole population perish? We must choose. They can't do this, I told my father. Why does he get to choose who goes and who stays? The reality was starting to hit me. I was going to be sent to a camp. I was going to be sent away from my mother and father, away from my home. The crowd yelled and argued with the director, surging toward the stage. My father put his hands on my shoulders and steered me away. Come, Yannick, let's go. I couldn't believe what I'd heard. Papa, how can he ask such a thing? Because the Nazis have promised not to take him and his family, and people will do anything to protect their families. He should know that better than anyone. I don't want to go. Don't let them take me, I said. I could feel myself trembling, but I didn't want to let on just how deeply terrified I was. They won't, my father told me. I'll protect you. He smiled. Besides, tomorrow you will no longer be a child, will you, Yannick? Do you think I've forgotten it's your birthday? To be honest, I had thought he would forget. Mother, too. There was nothing to mark the days now except the Sabbath, and we had to observe it in secret anyway. But I knew. Tomorrow was my 13th birthday, the day I would officially become a man. Your mother and I have said nothing because how can we possibly hold a bar mitzvah for you? If we're caught celebrating it, we'll be killed. I nodded. I'd been looking forward to my bar mitzvah for as long as I could remember, but now it wasn't going to happen. It couldn't. Still, my father said, like he could read my mind, we will celebrate it. But how? Tonight, father told me, go to sleep in your clothes. That night, I lay awake in my clothes, tossing and turning. My bar mitzvah, I thought. A bar mitzvah is the ceremony in which a Jewish boy becomes a man. The first time he reads aloud from the Torah, usually all of my school friends and aunts and uncles and cousins would have come to see me read in the synagogue. There would have been a kadush after the service with challah rolls, potatoes, chicken. My stomach growled just thinking about it. But of course, there was no synagogue anymore and no shala rolls or potatoes or chicken. A few hours must have passed before I heard my father stir, my mother too. I sat up on my mattress and waited while my father pulled on his overcoat. We must be quiet, father whispered, like the night we went to Abraham's bakery. I nodded and stood. My mother came to me and hugged me tight. Come back to me a man, my Yannick. Only come back. I will, I promised her. Mother kissed me on the cheek and walked us to the steel door that protected our rooftop home. She slid the metal bars back in place when we were through, and we made our way quietly down the dark stairs of our apartment building. Tonight, there was no snow, but it was cold. We could see the breath from our noses. I pushed my hands down into my pockets as far as they would go and wished I hadn't outgrown my gloves. Father led me through the back alleys again. Once, we turned a corner to find another night stalker. It was a Jewish boy carrying a bag of something over his shoulder. Food, I guess, smuggled through some holes in the wall, and all three of us gasped. When it was clear none of us was a Nazi, we all hurried on our way without a word, but we were even more cautious than before. Our path took us toward the wall, and at first I wondered if Father meant to take us out. We climbed into an old abandoned warehouse building that stood along the wall at Dabrowski Street. Almost every window was broken and open to the sighing wind, and the rotted wooden floor had holes in it. There were stairs at the back, narrow and rickety and occasionally missing a tread, and down we went into the basement. It wasn't exactly where I had imagined celebrating one of the biggest milestones of my life, but I followed along without a word. There were men in the basement waiting for us. My uncles, Abraham and Mashi, my cousin David, two more men I recognized as friends of my father, and three more I didn't know. 
One of them held a set of Torah scrolls in a burlap sack, saved perhaps from one of the ghetto synagogues before it burned to the ground. The men whispered hello. Ordinarily, my uncles and cousins would have embraced us and talked, but everyone was too scared of being out after curfew to say anything more. My stomach growled loud in the silent basement, reminding me that now that I was awake, I should be finding it some food. The stairs creaked behind us and we all turned. My heart was in my throat. If we were caught down here together with the Torah in hand, I would never become a man. I would be shot dead on sight. But the shoes we saw coming down were not the glistening boots of an SS officer. They were the brown leather soles of Mr. Tatarka from down the hall. Now we are ten men, my father whispered. He smiled at me, and soon we shall be eleven. I'm sorry we did not have more time for your studies, Yannick. Just do your best. The Torah scrolls were taken out and unrolled so I could read from them. My Hebrew was rough. Before the Nazis, I would have been at the synagogue once or twice a week ahead of time practicing for this, but of course that was impossible now. I muddled through and asked if and if God or man heard anything amiss, neither of them called me on it. When I was finished, my father chanted a blessing over me in the place of our rabbi, who had been killed by the Germans. He prayed in Hebrew, then spoke in Polish. Yannick, my son, he said, looking at me solemnly. You are a man now, with all the duties of an adult under Jewish law. You are now responsible for your own sins, but also for your own goodness. Remember what the Talmud teaches. Life is but a river. It has no beginning, no middle, no end. All we are, all we are worth, is what we do while we float upon it. How we treat our fellow man. Remember this, and a good man you will be. I will, Father, I said. I had waited for this day, looked forward to it for years. Suddenly, it didn't matter that we weren't in a synagogue, that we didn't have a feast waiting for us afterward. The smile on my father's face filled me with pride. The men all shook my hand and wished me mazel tov before hurrying off. They're leaving tonight, most of them, Mashi told us, trying to escape before tomorrow's deportation. Seven thousand? Never so many. We'll survive, my father told him. Come to our pigeon coop and hide with us. Oscar and his river, Uncle Mashi said. You should talk some sense into him now that you're a man, Yannick. The man who falls asleep on the river drowns.